Council of Flaherty. Council of Jackson. Council of LaMatina. Council of Linehan. Here. Council of McCarthy. Here. Council of Murphy. Here. Council of O'Malley. Here. Council of Presley. Council of Wu. Council of Yancey. And Council of Zakem. Mr. President, we have. I've been informed by the clerk that a quorum is present. I would ask at this time for all councilors guests to please rise. And I will ask Council O'Malley to come to the podium to introduce today's clergy. After the invocation is delivered, I would ask all members and guests to remain standing as we recite the Pledge of Allegiance led by Council O'Malley. Council O'Malley. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, good afternoon, colleagues. It is my great uh, and distinct honor today to re uh, welcome Reverend Linda Wood Boyle, who will offer our opening prayer. Uh, Reverend uh, Boyle is the new executive director of Project Hope, uh, an organization I know all of us know well. I'm proud to be affiliated with. It was my former and now future uh, marathon team. Uh, and many of you were with us as we celebrated the legendary Sister Margaret Leonard, who, served, who founded the organization for more than 30 years, served. Uh, and Mayor Walsh was kind enough to dedicate a street in her honor last, uh, I guess it was last fall uh, or last winter. Um, certainly, she leaves big shoes to fill, and Linda Wood Boyle will more than uh, exceed that. She's got a lifetime of career working with homeless families, working with youth. Most recently, she was the executive director of Homestart, a program I know many of you have worked with as well. Uh, and she's just an amazing woman. She's a resident of the Clam Point section of Dorchester and Councilor Baker's district. Um, and I invite you to, to listen to her words. And then again, uh, I know she's uh, open and welcoming to bring in any of us to Project Hope to meet some of the success, success stories toward the facility and see ways that we can continue to partner. So please join me in welcoming uh, Reverend Linda Wood Boyle. Thank you. Thank you, Council O'Malley. May we be in the spirit of prayer. Gracious and loving God, we ask for your presence in this room on this day. As you anointed leaders and called prophets of old, lead us to recognize our true representatives and authentic leaders, men and women who love your people and can walk with them, who feel their pain and share their joys, who dream their dreams, and strive to accompany them on their common goal. Bless this gathering, and with your spirit, embolden them to serve your people and to bring real glory to your name. Amen. Amen. Uh, thank you, uh, Reverend Linda Wood Boyle, for your uh, inspiring message and prayer. Council Laura Mallet. I pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, on which it stands under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, thank you, Councilor O'Malley, and uh, thank you, Reverend Linda Wood Boyle. And uh, Madam Clerk, could you please recognize that Councilor Lamatina and Councilor Yancey are present? Um, at this time, I would like to um, ask. Uh, that the uh, principals of the current paper, Dave Roberts and uh, Jen, Jen Tracy, if you would make your way up to the dais here. And I'd like to ask Josh Sakem to uh, join me also. Um, we're here um, to, re uh, to recognize and uh, celebrate the 20-year anniversary of the, uh, the Boston Back Bay Current. And, um, and uh, I want to uh, uh, give Councilor uh, Zakem an opportunity to say a few words first. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you for uh, letting me join with you in recognizing uh, this great institution that covers many of the neighborhoods that I represent uh, in District 8. Dave and Jen have been uh, integral parts of this community. Uh, for a very long time and are certainly people, not only do I see around at every community meeting, social uh, community gathering, whether it's social, whether it's a civic association or uh, other sort of meeting, um, 
very fierce advocates for our neighborhoods, which is something I'm grateful for. Certainly, I think it makes my job easier and that of uh, many of the civic association members we work with. And it's an honor to wish you congratulations on a 20 successful year. Uh, thank you, Councilor Zaken. And um, if you if you're fortunate to have uh, Dave uh, Jacobs and um, and Jen um, in your district, and many of the uh, if 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 the the, the circulation uh, goes across much of uh, the downtown neighborhoods of Boston, which Josh and I uh, represent most of them, and all of you at large do also, you realize what a significant and uh, job. And every week there's a, a quality paper that goes out and addresses the, uh, the topics of these neighborhoods that some people think are disparate, but a, a particular um, publication like this keeps all the downtown neighborhoods informed of what's going on and also uh, about what we do as uh, uh, municipal elected officials. So I want to congratulate them and thank them for all they've done in support of the, the members of the council and, and I specifically. Um, you did endorse me last time, right? Yes. <laughs> Josh? No. No? <laughs> All right, maybe you should read this. I'm working on, I'm working on them for next time. <laughs> oh, God. Step in. <laughs> That's beautiful. All right. Uh, uh, so we have a, 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 a resolution. Do you want to say a few words before we present the resolution? Okay. Oh, we'll do it after. Okay, we'll do it after. Uh, uh, because I will be announcing the coup taking over as president of the city. <laughs> <laughs> a resolution of the Boston City Council president and Councilor uh, Josh Zakin. Whereas the Boston City Council extends their thank you and congratulations to Dave Jacobs and Jen Tracy of the Boston Current for their 20 years of publishing. And whereas the Boston Current has been keeping the citizens of Boston's downtown neighborhoods, the Back Bay, Beacon Hill, Fenway, South End, and Seaport District, as well as Bay Village, up to the state, up to date, and informed for 20 years. Dave Jacobs and Jen Tracy, owners and publisher of the Boston Current, are committed to informing the residents of business of issues affecting their daily lives on a weekly basis. And Josh, I'll let you finish. We're right here. Uh, In hopes of good things to come. <laughs> Whereas the Boston Current, Dave Jacobs, and Jen Tracy's dedication to the downtown neighborhoods of Boston has been unwavering for their years of service, the Boston Current is currently the largest weekly circulation in Boston. The Boston City Council commends you on your success, contribution, and dedication to the 20 years of service to the citizens of Boston. Therefore, be it resolved that the Boston City Council and meeting assembled does hereby wholeheartedly congratulate and thank Dave Jacobs and Jen Tracy for their many years of dedication and commitment to journalism. You can all relax. I'm going to be very, very brief. My wife keeps telling me that the less I speak, the higher the probability that you're going to think that I'm intelligent as opposed to stupid. My poor wife was with me 23 hours a day, but she's smart enough to know when to turn off her hearing aid. And we've been doing this for 20 years. Oh, my God. And just watching the evolution of the Boston City Council over that time, and as I look around today, it's much more reflective of what the neighborhoods of Boston are all about. And one of the things that has amazed me is how, as opposed to 20 years ago, 15, 10 years ago, you all seem to work in harmony. Either that or you're bluffing it very well. Uh, Council President Linehan, you're running a very smooth operation, as did your predecessor, Steve Murphy. I don't know if you're putting Valium in the water or what have you. You're hardly at the point where you're sitting around a campfire singing Kumbaya to each other, but at least there is an open, honest, and intellectual discussion of the issues, as opposed to what it was like 20 years ago where discussions were based more on personalities than anything else. 
We've grown. I've seen the city council grow and evolve over that time. It has really been a pleasure covering you all. And we didn't laugh at my jokes, by the way. This is an endorsement year, I believe. <laughs> On it. Remember our motto, we can't be bought, only leased, for political <laughs> endorsements. This is on TV, you know. As it should be. <laughs> like Donald Trump, the ratings will go up. Okay. Keep in, I'm a legend in my own mind. Seriously, though, I want to thank this body for the recognition of it. It's been so much fun uh, publishing a weekly newspaper. As Mayor Menino told me very early on, people who are engaged in their community, the people who vote, read their neighborhood newspapers. That we, not just the Quran, but all of the other weekly newspapers in the city of Boston hopefully serve a very vital function to let those interested in their neighborhoods know what is really going on. On behalf of my wife and I, we sincerely say thank you very, very much for this honor. Okay, come on, they're all going to come. Come right up front here. Close. You have a dress code? Everyone wears pink? Yes. That's it. You wear your pink? I think it was the only ones here. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> okay, good. Why don't you hold this up and so on? There you go. Are we all here? The endorsement editorial is getting longer and longer. <laughs> All right. Yeah, congratulations and thank you, David. Thank you. Jen. So, so. No, no. Our pleasure. No, no, absolutely. Um, could all of you uh, please, we, uh, Kerry would like to take a picture uh, because um, today, as you all dutifully did, you all wore pink to recognize that today is a, a, a breast awareness week here in uh, today and this week uh, here in the city of Boston. So, uh, Carrie wanted to take a photograph of all of us down here. So, Madam Clerk, yep. well, wh where is Carrie? You what? Yeah, he did. He wants us in here. I don't know exactly where, but there he is. Down the bottom. Okay. Come on, Ed. Oh. Huh? But he's gonna say it, <laughs> Frank. I'm up front already. In the back. <laughs> In the stomach. Box second. Uh, Panda taking second.
Where, which of us gets to, uh, yeah. on the front of the leg? Keep fighting out, Alex. Well, thank you all for participating, and uh, and and uh, thanks for the current uh, for being here today, so we can recognize them. If there are no corrections to be made, the minutes of the last meeting will stand approved. Seeing and hearing no objections, the minutes are so approved. Reports of public officers and others, Madam Clerk, please. I already introduced you. <laughs> Three, communication was received from the Department of Environment and Energy and Open Space regarding emergency generator power for telecommunication equipment at 35 Northampton Street. Our docket 1623 will be placed on file. Madam Clerk, Matt has recently heard for possible action. Please. Docket number 1299, order to discuss granting solar personal rapid transit permission to construct, operate, repair, and maintain in the city of Boston. Chair recognized the Chair of the Committee on Environment and Parks, Council O'Malley, thank on you. Docket 1299. Thank you. So much. Uh, thank you. Uh, we had a hearing uh, on Monday on Docket number 1299. This was uh, sponsored by uh, City Council at Large, Stephen Murphy. Uh, he may want to speak on it. Right now, we're asking that it remains in committee. Thank you. Uh, docket uh, 1299 will remain in the Committee on Environment and Parks. Thank you, Council O'Malley. Madam Clerk. Yeah. Oh, did you? Um, <laughs> <laughs> no. Yes. Well, not yet. It won't. It, it won't be in the committee on environment parks just yet. Councillor Murphy. Thank you, Mr. President. I want to thank Councillor O'Malley for holding a uh, a quick hearing on this docket 1299, which would develop a uh, solar powered personal rapid transit service, augmenting our. Um, MBTA service and reducing uh, clogged traffic in the city. Uh, we, we had a hearing on it. There is a Senate bill number 1287, which as a first uh, step in this process has to get passed at the legislature. So at some point in time, we'll be moving a resolution to support Senate 1287 um, and its passage up at the State House. But basically, what we're seeking to do, and we have the administration represented by Chris Cook, the chief of streets, as well as others here, is to um, get a pilot program of, of a monorail that is solar powered that is going to travel between North and South Station. And it is privately funded and privately operated so that there would be no additional debt on the taxpayers of the Commonwealth or the taxpayers of Boston as we're uh, fighting to, I guess, close in the loop between North and South Station. And there are other potential neighborhood sites where this could, could work as well. But we're going to roll it out slowly. The first step would be supporting uh, Senate Bill 1287 at the State House. I want to thank, once again, Councilor O'Malley and my colleagues for attending and uh, having their input in the hearing. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, thank you, Councilor Murphy. Docket 1299 will remain in the Committee on Environment and Parks. Docket number 1408, message and order authorizing the City of Boston to accept and expend a grant of $350,000 from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs to the Massachusetts Office of Coastal Zone Management to be administered by the City of Boston's Environment Department. Chair recognizes the Chair of the Committee on Environment and Parks, Councilor O'Malley, on Docket 1408. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, also on Monday, the Committee on Environment and Parks held a hearing on Docket Number 1408, uh, which, as you said, was a, is, is a message in order authorizing the City to accept and expend a grant of $350,000 uh, 
uh, from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs through the Mass Office of Coastal Zone Management to be administered by the City of Boston's Environment Department. Um, we, this grant would by, be primarily used to hire a consultant to conduct a climate vulnerability assessment, uh, as well as to contribute measures of decreasing the vulnerability uh, of the city's infrastructure during a, national, uh, a natural weather event. Um, we have all seen the images coming out of South Carolina last week. We were all, many of us were here during Superstorm Sandy, certainly during the uh, record setting, breaking, and I hope remaining winter of last year. Climate change is real. Climate change is a great, great, grave threat that we face as a city. So I appreciate this opportunity to accept a grant of about $350,000 that will uh, identify areas where we can uh, better prepare ourselves for some cataclysmic storm. Um, as I said, this is a $350,000 grant, which will assess, essentially fund an assessment. It will also be used for things without getting any, any specifics, because Carl Spector uh, wouldn't ahead of the point. But this could be something as simple as building a, a seawall in East Boston or making sure there were uh, ample sump pubs for city and, and private uh, dwellings in certain parts of the city. So. Uh, I urge quick action today and I urge passage of this docket uh, to allow for access of funds for a very, very, very important issue. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, thank you, Council O'Malley. Council O'Malley moves acceptance of the committee report and passage of docket 1408. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed nay. The ayes have it. Docket 1408 has passed. Docket number 1296, Ordinance Establishing Procedures for the Safe Disposal of Needles, Syringes, and Lancets in the City of Boston. Uh, Chair, recognize the Chair of the Committee on Government Operations, Council of Flaherty, on Docket 1296. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, we had a great hearing yesterday. It was well attended by uh, representatives of the Boston Public Health Commission, Boston Police Department, uh, EMS, uh, as well as uh, we had uh, a great testimony from. Uh, from a resident and taxpayer who has a first line, front line experience with this particular issue. So um, on behalf of both of my colleagues, Councilor Murphy and Councilor McCarthy, who co-sponsored it, and we'll defer to them for additional comments. Uh, we've asked that it remain in the Government Operations Committee uh, in an effort to work with uh, the uh, Mayor's office and his representatives to try to make this um, and to expand upon the program that he has um, and also to incorporate some of the great ideas that uh, were put forth yesterday at yesterday's hearing. So uh, with that, uh, I'll defer through the chair to the makers. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councilor Flaherty. Councilor Murphy. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I want to thank Councilor Flaherty for uh, convening a speedy hearing on this matter. Um, what we learned yesterday, Mr. President, is that the Public Health Commission has a uh, new program with two employees. Um, riding together, picking up uh, syringes that are found in parks, playgrounds, et cetera, <clears throat> public land across the city. Uh, we had some questions about whether or not two employees were enough and um, whether or not a call would come in through the new 311 line or to 911. Uh, we were trying to do this by ordinance. It was an ordinance. That's why it's in government operations. But what we came away with was at least uh, keeping it in government ops to have working sessions to um, start an awareness campaign in Boston through the city council for residents and for city and community groups for the safest procedures when someone comes across a needle, increase the number of drop-off boxes around the city at fire stations, EMS sites, police stations, hospitals, and maybe even pharmacies that sell needles. Uh, work with hospitals and pharmacies to explain to patients how to dispose of needles properly. And um, the, the understanding that there is an unpredictability um, of needle users, frankly. Uh, um, and it's a difficult regulation to enforce. So we're going to continue our discussions with the city administration and with the stakeholders to come up with something that makes our parks and playgrounds safer and works for all of Boston's uh, residents. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, thank you, Councilor Murphy. Councilor McCarthy. 
Thank you very much, Mr. President, <clears throat> and uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Murphy, for uh, co-sponsoring this uh, together. A um, couple weeks ago, we had a hearing on the education of um, Boston Public Schools and all school-aged children about uh, the education of what a needle was and, and how we're going to promote uh, and make sure that these kids in the future um, aren't picking them up, uh, the, the, these discarded needles. Um, yesterday, we were talking about the protocol of how the city reacts to uh, a found needle, but it was also a, a very big learning experience. I know uh, for me, I opened up uh, the, the hearing by asking a question, which I, I, I thought was uh, everybody knew except me, that you could buy a needle uh, at CVS or the pharmacy. I did not know that. Uh, you don't need a prescription. You can go in. In fact, while we were here, I looked it up online, and you can buy 10 for $2.10 on Amazon. Um, so this, there's a lot more issues that came out uh, as, as we started to filter this through talking with uh, the public health as well as uh, Chief Hooley, uh, who is here. So I'm really looking forward to the working session as we tie in the educational component to protect our children. And uh, as we continue forth uh, with this as the protocol of the city of Boston, and clearly, uh, as Councillor Murphy and Councillor Flaherty both alluded to, We've picked up 5,000 needles this year, and uh, that's an awful lot. Um, Council Lamatina had somebody uh, that was stuck just the other day when cleaning leaves at the Bocce Court. Um, so this is something that we've, we've allowed since uh, 2006. We changed the law that you could buy needles at CVS and Walgreens to protect the users uh, from uh, passing on uh, diseases, and yet it's now coming back. We're not protected of the people who are, who are not using our children and our and our people in the park. So this is going to be a very interesting topic as we go down the line. I'm looking forward to a working session. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, thank you, Council McCarthy. Council Lamatina. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I just want to take this opportunity um, to thank the makers of the hearing yesterday because it was a very good hearing. Monday night, one of my constituents did get uh, pricked by a needle, uh, cleaning leaves in a park at the Barchie Court. Spend the night at the Mass General Hospital, and um, now he's on all these medication and has to take an HIV test in a month. Um, but I want to commend the administration because I did go on 311 and put the complaint there. The parks department went out there yesterday, they cleaned the park because I was concerned that if there was one needle, there might be more needles at um, Langoni Park. So they on overtime because it was late. They cleaned the park. And Captain Fong, I had a conversation with him yesterday about my concerns at the park, and they actually made an arrest yesterday for someone doing drugs while they were out there. So I want to take this minute, uh, time just to thank the administration um, and just urge those who are watching to use that 311. Take a picture, use it, uh, and I even got a, a response last night. So thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, thank you, Council Lamartina. A docket uh, 1296 will remain in the Committee on Government Operations. Docket number 0568, order regarding a text amendment for Boston Zoning Code Medical Marijuana Treatment Centers. Chair recognizes the Chair of the Committee on Economic Development and Planning and Labor, Council Lamartina, on 0468. Thank you, Mr. President. 0568, uh, excuse me. Yesterday afternoon, we had a hearing on. Docket number 0568, uh, with public health, BRA, and the administration. Um, it will remain in the committee, but I know the maker uh, would like to discuss uh, the hearing. Thank you. Uh, Michael Flaherty, Council Flaherty. Uh, thank you, Council Lamartina. Council Flaherty. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and thank you to the Chair, uh, Council Lamartina, for hosting the hearing yesterday. Uh, we heard uh, some great testimony from the Boston Public Health Commission, as well as uh, former member of the City Council, Rosemary Sansone, uh, representing the business district. And uh, pretty straightforward, we got some great input from colleagues. Uh, so we're asking that it uh, stay in committee uh, so we can work with the administration and adopt some of the ideas that were put forth by Council Baker and Council O'Malley yesterday. Uh, and it's pretty straightforward stuff. Uh, we understand the reality around medicinal uh, marijuana dispensaries. Uh, we can also um, expect or forecast that in the very near future, either by ballot or uh, by an initiative uh, by colleagues in government up at Beacon Hill. Recreational marijuana will soon follow uh, and will be a reality. And this is just really a, a common sense uh, solution to make sure that we're protecting neighborhoods from uh, the marijuana, the recreational marijuana saturation that will ensue. It will be an absolute frenzy, and we'll see uh, neighborhood business districts 
uh, overturned and overrun by cannabis cafes and pot shops. So we like our coffee shops, we like our dry cleaners, we like our bakeries, uh, and clearly we'll have to make an accommodation here. And so what this text amendment does, it basically says that no facility, either medicinal or recreational marijuana, can be located within 2,500 feet uh, of a medicinal marijuana facility. So it kind of gives us an opportunity to create uh, some safeguards for residents so that no one neighborhood should have to bear the burden uh, that will ensue once uh, recreational marijuana becomes a reality. And, and, uh, and in fact, I argue, and I know and I, uh, Council Malley had made some great points about uh, the need for medicinal marijuana, and I concur uh, with those, but I also um, feel that there's a percentage of folks who probably now have these medicinal cards that really don't have a, a, a debilitating ailment, and that's sort of their way to be able to possess and to carry this stuff. And I think what's going to happen, and we'll see, is once recreational marijuana becomes a reality, uh, instantly thousands of people will be, be cured of those nagging injuries, and they'll rip up those medicinal cards, and they'll go uh, the recreational route. And I just want to make sure that our neighborhoods, every single neighborhood of Boston, uh, the neighborhoods that my district colleagues represent are protected uh, from what will be uh, a frenzy and an oversaturation. This will be the uh, answer and the solution to protect that community. So that said, uh, we'd like to work together, uh, take in some, incorporate some of the ideas from colleagues uh, like Council Baker and Council Malley, who raised them yesterday, along with Council Lamentina, and uh, put together a product that uh, the mayor uh, and his team will be able to support. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, thank you, Council of Flaherty. Council Baker. Thank you, Mr. President. I just rise to, to commend the maker of this here. I, I think as a city council, I urge everybody to really pay attention to this issue because the, 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 the issue that I see coming down the pipeline for us will be if um, recreational goes goes through, which it probably will, we need to make sure that our neighborhoods are protected because if it's just a retail retail use, we all have retail in our district. So we we lived through the hoops that had to be had to be jumped through for the medicinal for the medicinal um, operations. I fear that if if we don't get a hold on this, and, and I, again thank the maker for this to make sure that that we're on the front end of this and and don't have to go through. And, and I I don't have experience of what Colorado is going through. I've seen programs of whole streets just turning into just basically pot shops. Um, that would be very disconcerting for me if it happened, if a whole street in my district turned over. So again, I, I think this is good work by the city council here. And if we can, and if we can have some protections on the front end and we're not scrambling like the way we were for medicinal, um, I just think it's good work by the city council here. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councilor Baker. Councilor Jackson. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. I, I rise to compliment the maker on this. We don't have to um, actually look to Denver to see what this looks like. We can look to Councilor Baker's district and part of your district in the New Market area um, to look at what the high concentration of uh, services, um, healthcare services or uh, other types of services um, in one place actually does to a neighborhood and, and a community. Um, and so I think um, this legislation also, uh, to me, would be some great test legislation um, to look at um, the ability for the city of Boston uh, to work with the state of Massachusetts to determine where um, methadone clinics and other types of clinics actually go um, in the city of Boston. Having three or four in a, in a five block radius um, has um, been to the detriment of uh, many of the communities that uh, you and I share, as well as Councilor Baker share, uh, shares. And so I think this uh, legislation, proactive legislation before we um, before the, any laws actually change on a recreational level uh, puts the council uh, in a situation where we're actually leading and not following uh, the legislation. So I want to compliment you on that and really look forward to tracking it because hopefully we could use uh, this same rationale uh, to deal with uh, other types of uh, regulated substances in the, in the state of Massachusetts and the city of Boston. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councilor Jackson. A docket 0568 will remain in the Committee on Economic Development, Planning, and Labor. Madam Clerk, docket 0274.
Docket number 0274, order for hearing to discuss recruiting and retaining educators of color within the Boston Public Schools. I chair recognizes the chair of the Committee on Education, Councilor Jackson. Uh, Mr. Chair, I also want to acknowledge the work that Councilor Presley um, has been doing uh, in, in these hearings. Um, these, uh, this has been a, a really great ongoing conversation um, with the uh, now new uh, folks in the um, uh, Tommy Chang uh, superintendency. And um, the, the, the look is um, at uh, the pipeline that the Boston Public Schools is building uh, to continue uh, to have a workforce that is a reflection of the young people who are in the schools. Um, there are some encouraging programs uh, that are uh, happening in the system um, with actually some really good results. Um, one of the programs is actually taking people who are paraprofessionals and giving them additional training um, and actually sending them through a program at UMass uh, that has now been discounted to about $8,000. So there are people who are actually becoming uh, teachers who are already in the classroom, um, not as a teacher, um, and, and elevating uh, 35 members in a, um, out of 108 people who applied. We really looked at how the Boston Public Schools can be its own best recruitment me uh, mechanism in, uh, in itself. Um, in addition, uh, we've seen um, a, a larger um, uh, spread uh, relative to the, where the recruitment uh, has actually been occurring. Uh, we know that uh, the, most of the schools in Massachusetts um, don't really have uh, diverse populations um, in their master's in education programs. And so there's a lot uh, that's going on in that space. Um, there's an October 1 to October 1 analysis that occurs. Um, much of that analysis was not able to, to get done. Uh, and we look forward to having um, one, uh, an, another meeting uh, in about a month. Uh, but uh, it has been a, a very uh, robust and uh, good conversation about what we can do uh, to make sure uh, that we close the achievement gap. And that's what the real, the real goal. Uh, this is not only about who, uh, who we hire, um, in the classrooms, but the objective is uh, those people that we hire in these classrooms um, uh, in terms of their cultural competencies um, as well as their abilities will help close the achievement gap and make Boston uh, the best public school education, uh, large urban public school education in the country. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Councilor Jackson. Councilor Presley. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. President. Um, I just wanted to thank the Chair of Education. Uh, Councilor Jackson for uh, his leadership and due diligence in this space for staying the course. Um, you know, as he uh, referenced, this is uh, not just about having a, a teaching force that reflects um, the population of its students in our city just for the sake of, um, you know, I think there is a direct correlation that can be drawn um, with our black and brown boys who have been at the bottom of every educational outcome and the need for us to have um, uh, a teaching force that where they see themselves reflected. Um, that's one of the issues uh, also that uh, in our working sessions we continue to highlight that it's not just about recruiting and retaining educators of color, but also in acknowledging there is um, a male teacher shortage and how um, everyone stands to benefit from that. So, you know, gender racial parity uh, within the classroom is critical. And also one of the things that came out of the working session, thanks to Councilor Jackson's uh, diligence in this space, is we learned that uh, more mature teachers and teachers of color uh, were disproportionately uh, being, um, you know, impacted by teacher evaluation and, and, other, uh, and other efforts. So, again, I just come in the chair and thank him for his leadership. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councilor Presley. Councilor Yancey. <clears throat> uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. I'd too like to uh, commend the chair of the Education Committee. The issue of diversity in our classrooms is far more uh, significant today than it was when Judge Garrity issued his ruling. Today, the uh, students of color represent uh, more than 85% of the total population. And I believe um, we're facing a serious crisis in terms of the uh, apparent decline of the proportion of uh, teachers of color in our classroom due in part because of the high number of uh, retirements hitting uh, the school department at this time. So, uh, again, I just rise to commend the chair and thank him for uh, focusing attention on this very important issue because it does have an impact, as was mentioned, on the achievements of uh, students of color who, like all other students, identify with their teaching staff of all races. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Councilor Yancey. Docket 0274 will remain in the Committee on Education. Motions, orders, and resolutions. Madam Clerk, please.
be recognized. Uh, Councilor Jackson, you have the floor. Um, I actually just did want to acknowledge our staff, um, Corinne, who stayed till 8.30 last night um, to staff us. So I, I just think, uh, um, I just wanted to take the time to uh, thank her uh, for her hard work and dedication. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councilor Jackson. Um, Madam Clerk, motions, orders, and resolutions, please. Docket number 1624, Council Zakem offered the following order for hearing to review the results of the 2015 Fenway Parking Ordinance. Chair recognizes Councilor Zakem on docket 1624. Uh, thank you, Ms. Um, introduce this uh, hearing order to review the uh, results of the pilot program that this body uh, enacted unanimously and that the mayor signed uh, earlier this year to protect residents of the Fenway. Kenmore and Audubon Circle neighborhoods from the uh, 30 or 40,000 people who come in, not only for the 81 Red Sox home games a year, unfortunately. I think that's as many as we're going to get getting this year. Um, but obviously in better years, more home games, but also concerts, events, road races. Um, during Fenway events, uh, historically, with the citywide uh, resident parking violation fine being only $40 and lots around Fenway regularly being $50, $55, or $60, people were just sort of rolling the dice and taking resident spaces. Uh, anecdotally, this has been a very successful program. We've received emails from the very beginning when this started and periodically since and calls from Fenway residents that they can find parking on occasion. Uh, from communication with the Transportation Department, it seems like not only this program paying for itself, uh, it's really altering behavior, which was really the goal for this. So uh, we look forward to having this hearing to hear from BTD, from Fenway residents, from Red Sox officials and others, uh, whether this program has been as efficient and successful as I believe it is, and then how to move forward and making sure this uh, continues into the future. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Council Zakem. Council Flaherty. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, rise to have my name added, and it's obviously very important data uh, that were vast through that pilot program, and uh, getting that data, and then it potentially uh, could impact, uh, I would argue, with probably Council Martinez District with respect to uh, Bruins and South Exchange. So, uh, so we sort of carved out uh, the Fenway as sort of a trial. A balloon, if you will, for the pilot program, working with uh, Council Zakem and the Transportation Department. And so eagerly await that data so if I could add my name onto it. And then sure. that conversation may expand pretty quickly to impact other districts, particularly probably Council Martinez district. So I would want to make sure that Council Martin is in tune with what's happening and whether or not it would make a difference. And, and also potentially could play into things that he's been talking about since he's joined the body with respect to expanding uh, the meter times. Uh, like other major cities. So right now we're 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Uh, he's made uh, significant and prudent uh, uh, arguments around expanding that to 9, 10, 11, maybe even midnight. So, and that also could play a role into what's happening over the Fenway uh, and Council Zacob's district. So it's a, it could be a multi district type of uh, uh, scenario here, but uh, that's important data. So I look forward to uh, getting it and having an expedited hearing. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Thank you, Councilor Flaherty. Please add Councilor Flaherty's name to that. Councilor Jackson's name. Councilor Councilor McCarthy's name. Councilor Murphy. Councilor O'Malley. Councilor Presley. Councilor Wool. Councilor Yancey. And um, Councilor Lamartine, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. President. I just want to take this opportunity to commend uh, Councilor Zakem um, on this trial. Um, I'm looking forward to the findings because um, as Councilor Flaherty did say uh, we might be interested in expanding that around the North Station area, the North End, particularly in the North End, probably the West End, maybe in your district itself, um, because there's a problem during the games. We see it all over the neighborhood, cars are parking everywhere, yep. some of them Ill illegally. So I want to commend the maker and please ask, add my name. Uh, thank you, Councilor Martina. Please add Councilor Martina's name and please add my name. Uh, docket 1624 is assigned to the Committee on City, Neighborhood Services, and Veterans Affairs. I'm informed by the clerk that there are three late file matters, which in absence of objection will be added to today's agenda. Hearing no objections, the matters are so added. The clerk will read the first late file matter. On October 7th, 2015, Councilor Bill Linehan for Councilor O'Malley ordered. Councilor O'Malley moves suspension of the rules and passage of the first late file matter. All those in favor say aye. All opposed nay. The ayes have it. Uh, the first late file matter has passed. 
from the Office of Mayor Martin J. Walsh, October 7th, 2015, to the City Council. Dear Council, as I transmit herewith for your approval a home rule petition to the General Court entitled An Act Relative to the Quota of Number of Alcohol Beverages Licenses Granted by the Licensing Board of the City of Boston. And I'll just read the last paragraph. Yes, Mr. President. A technicality in Chapter 287 of the Acts of 2014, however, prevented the City of Boston from receiving the five all-alcohol non-restricted transferable licenses per year, which is a total of 15, as approved and supported by the City and the Massachusetts Legislature. Therefore, this Act provides a technical correction that will allow the City to attain the 15 licenses that the legislature intended for us to receive. I urge your honorable body to adopt this act expeditiously. Sincerely, Martin J. Walsh, Mayor of Boston. Our Council of Irony. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, moving at this time for suspension of passage through you, uh, if we could uh, get some comments from uh, Councilor Ian Presley, who's taken the lead on behalf of our body on this particular issue. But as the clerk has just eloquently stated, there was a technical glitch this is really uh, just simple uh, housekeeping uh, that will also safeguard the city and allow us to get these very m much needed uh, licenses that uh, this body through Council Presley has fought for for, for, uh, for a significant period of time. So thank you, Mr. President. And no objections? Councilor Presley? Oh, thank you, Chairman Flaherty and uh, President Linehan. Uh, in 2014, with your support, uh, we passed historic liquor license reform that included 75 new licenses to Boston over three years. However, in the wee hours of the session when this was passed, there was a drafting error in the legislation uh, which prohibits Boston from accessing 15 of those licenses. Now, the House passed a supplemental bill that included the technical correction. Tomorrow, the Senate is prepared to take this up, but they need a home rule petition to authorize the technical change. That is why the mayor and I are asking for your support in considering this late file now. Again, this is not a change to the law. It is simply correcting a drafting error. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councilor Presley. Councilor Yancey. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. I'd like to commend Councilor Presley and the Chair of Government Operations for bringing this uh, before us for expeditious action. And I'm going to support suspension and pass it. I just have a uh, question on this specific uh, item that applies to the non-restricted uh, transferable license. Uh, through you, uh, Mr. President, to, uh, uh, to the maker, uh, how does this impact the likelihood of uh, those communities that historically have not uh, benefited from these licenses. This particular category of, of non-restricted uh, licenses is what I'm concerned about. I thank you, Councilor Yancey. Council Presley? If I understand the, the uh, question, uh, Councilor Yancey, um, so the legislation was 75 licenses over three years, 25, 25, and 25, 80% of those restricted to main streets, and neighborhoods that have historically been disenfranchised and marginalized. Uh, the remainder are all city licenses. Um, and that is because, you know, we didn't name in the legislation Roxbury, Mattapan, and Dorchester because there are neighborhoods like a High Park or Charlestown or West Roxbury who also stand to benefit from this legislation who would rather have restaurants than banks on their main street. Uh, and that's why we didn't limit it, um, the legislation, to the siting of just those neighborhoods because there are other main streets and neighborhoods although not historically disenfranchised, uh, per se, but who are suffering blight on their main streets and could stand uh, to be economically revitalized uh, with a liquor license. So there's a public need in other neighborhoods, uh, even when they have not been historically disenfranchised. Uh, thank you, Councilor Presley. Councilor Yancey? Uh, just a brief follow-up uh, to the maker. Does that mean that these additional uh, 15 licenses. I know they were included in the original legislation, but since we're discussing it, would, would they be limited to, uh, to, the, uh, to depressed, economically depressed areas, or could they also be used 
to augment uh, those areas which already have These, uh, significant. Just for the clarification, yes. the, 15 the 15 are the ones that are citywide options. So they are available to anybody anywhere in the city. It's the other 75 that are restricted. No, I understood about the other 75, but my question remains, does this 15 in any way uh, increase the likelihood, at least, of uh, those uh, individual license holders who historically have not uh, participated in the holding of licenses in the past? In other words, in other words, uh, can these 15 licenses be used by um, individuals who, who already have licenses? You know, can we create a situation where the rich are getting richer? Uh, and that these additional 15 would be, could be utilized by those who already hold uh, lucrative uh, licenses in, in fairly well-to-do areas, or can they be used uh, to further augment those areas of the city that may not be mentioned in the legislation but may be indeed blighted? Yeah, I mean, it's my understanding that they're not restricted to those from those areas but are available across the city. Good. Yep. So, Country Yancia, again, um, you know, thanks to your support, um, this is legislation that was already passed by this body. Um, so, this is not legislative change. This is simply uh, a technical uh, change uh, in the drafting of the legislation, which was already passed. And, uh, you know, those were those were the original numbers that passed this body. So, it's 15 all city. Um, I would also add, um, no encounter Yancey of your commitment to um, minority and women enterprise that um, with these all city licenses, the first uh, cycle that we've already gone through, we have seen an increase in uh, minority and women uh, restaurant ownership, um, even in neighborhoods that have not historically been disenfranchised and marginalized. And I think that's important as well. Thank, uh, thank you. you, Council President. Councilor Murphy. Thank you, Mr. President. I'm not going to stand in the way of this either. I just simply would say that it's almost ridiculous that we have to go back to the legislature to increase the number of licenses in the city of Boston, our city. And this is another overreach of home rule and the process. And the other thing I would say about home rule and the process is if there was a technical glitch, it had to happen up there. And if it happened up there, it means they tinkered with the original bill, which they're not allowed to do. So which is it, legislature? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it is just for clarification, is my understanding that the partic that uh, the bill of that matter that was signed by the mayor did not restrict any um, change at the state level. OK. Just for clarification. Did, do you want to comment on that, Council President? And I said earlier. Okay. Um, and just for the purposes of the record, Councilor Yancey, um, so the legislation that ultimately was passed uh, certainly was inspired and informed by our original blueprint in Home Rule, but it is not the exact legislation that passed this body, so I did just want to offer that correction. Right. Uh, thank you, Council Press. And that goes just for, again, clarification. The home rule specifically have to say in that particular home rule that's voted on and that is signed by the mayor that it needs to stay at, that it doesn't, cannot be changed. Or then the uh, state legislature has the opportunity to weigh in on the matter and make alterations or amendments. So, um, Councilor Flaherty moves suspension of the rules and passage of the second late file matter. All those in favor say aye. aye. All opposed nay. The ayes have it. And the second late file matter has passed. Thank you all. Madam Clerk. Third late file from the office of Mayor Martin J. Walsh, October 6, 2015. Um, dear Madam Clerk, please note that I will be out of town from 7 a.m. on Wednesday, October 7th, until 4 p.m. on Thursday, October 8th. Please let me know if you have any questions. Sincerely, Martin J. Walsh, Mayor of Boston.
I don't hear anything. Oh, that's good. That is real good. Um, that matter will be placed on file. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Anybody wishing to remove a matter from the green sheets, please do so at this time. I don't see any lights flashing, so we will move on. Uh, there are two late file matters which, in absence of objection, will be added to the consent agenda. Seeing, hearing, no objection, the matters are so added. The chair moves adoption of the consent agenda. All those in favor say aye. All opposed nay. The ayes have it, and the consent agenda is adopted. I'd ask all guests and all members to please rise. As the council prepares to adjourn today's meeting in the memory of the following individuals. For I and Council of Flaherty, Max W. Adams, and Arthur G. Fritch, who is Ellen's father, Pastor Norm. For I, Councilor Wu, and Council of Flaherty, Tony Yee. For Councilors McCarthy and Murphy, Paul McDonald. For Councilor Romali, Dr. James Mahoney. For Councilor Yancey, Jonathan T. Julian, Miles Hinton, and Ermine Riley. Moment of silence. Oh, I'm sorry. I missed. Before we do that, for Councilor Sioma, Barbara J. Jasoma, and John Jack McLaughlin. For Councilor La Martina, Phyllis Forgery. For Councilor La Martina and O'Malley, Susan Pickman. And for the Chair, Lucy Ann Farula. A moment of silence, please. The chair moves that when the council adjourns today, it does so in memory of the aforementioned individuals. It is scheduled to meet again on Wednesday, October 21st at noon. All those in favor say aye of adjournment. All opposed nay. The ayes have it, and the council is so adjourned.